So today I would like to discuss, as you mentioned, women's internationalism and unaligned connections between Yugoslavia and the Global South, focusing specifically on Slovenian lawyer and politician Vida Tomšić and Serbian policy expert Nevenka Petric, who both had leadership roles in Yugoslavia and various international institutions at the same time. So the institutions they were gravitating around were uh, the Conference for the Social Activity of Women, which uh, succeeded um, the earlier Anti-Fascist Women's Front of Yugoslavia, which is probably the most known organization. And then uh, the Yugoslav Federal Council for Family Planning. And uh, internationally, uh, there were many institutions, but mainly I'm gonna be speaking about their engagement with the International Planned Parenthood Federation today. I will look at how these leaders express non-aligned standpoints and establish alliances with women's organization and activists in the Global South in international settings, particularly when it comes to pressing international issues, such as proposals for a new international economic order, which was advanced by um, Global South countries at the United Nations, as well as new Malthusianism in international population policies, and we're going to talk about this more in depth later, as well as the UN decade for women between 1975 and 1985. So uh, I'm also going to look at how they work together uh, for um, for a certain amount of time as scholars, activists, and friends, uh, and and this is based on different um, sources, different archives. So the one, the main, the main uh, source of information are uh, the the collection of Vida Tomšić in the state archives in Slovenia and Ljubljana. There is an extensive collection um, with with many many materials um, which are detailing her correspondence with her collaborators within Yugoslavia, but also a number of international figures, um, such as, for instance, Dolores Ibaruri or or other other very famous um, figures of of the Cold War era. And uh, the other the other interesting um, collection that that I. Uh, I could find is the one uh, that is in Kharkiv, Yugoslavia, in Belgrade, uh, from the Yugoslav Federal Council for Family Planning. However, this is just something I started to explore. I collected some material uh, through uh, some, some other people. Obviously, this was something um, related to. Um, there, are, there are, of course, there are other sources that are very interesting. Like uh, in the past, I worked on the. Um, on the press material as well in the um, in the state archives in Croatia, so there there is also some interesting material in relation to um, connection between uh, Yugoslav women's organization and international women's organization. So, um, and I, I think when we look at at this archive material, what what's really rich is the correspondence and. Um, as I mentioned, this is something at, as a, at an early stage, a project that is still at an early stage, but from the correspondence, we can really see that there were a very rich connection, both between, um, like within uh, within Yugoslavia and different, different activists working on uh, family planning and women's emancipation issues, but also um, at a transnational level with various activists involved in organizations such as the International uh, Planned Parenthood Federation. So I just wanted to read you um, this this letter, which is something that um, I found interesting because it kind of gives you a glimpse of the debates that were happening at the time, and also how how um, Petrich and uh, and Tomšić worked together. Um, they work together uh, on on issues within Yugoslavia, but also they work together a lot on um, how to present Yugoslavia in international meeting and how to interact with uh, international institutions. So, dear Vida, I warmly thank you for the booklet that was sent to me as per your request, in which is published your work in English on the politics of non-alignment, the struggle for a new international order, and the role of women in development. This work of yours will be a precious tool to orient myself in various situations. In relation to our last talks about my working schedule, the relevant personnel services in the Republic of Serbia recommended me as a substitute president for the Commission of Cooperation with UNESCO. This is a voluntary position. What do you think of this recommendation? They told me that people will seriously compete for the place. Could you perhaps support this candidacy through your channels, as it seems there will be various candidates? I don't know if you watched the program produced in Novi Sad last night, which has at his main guest, uh, Professor Branka Lajic. When she was asked what she thinks of the Miss Yugoslavia competition, she said that it was a good thing and that we seriously have beautiful women, especially among the younger generation, and that it's good to have such a competition, only that it should be thought out a bit more. I wish when I heard that. 
Who knows, maybe I'm getting old, but I nonetheless stand by my position. I'm not asking how you're doing. I hope that you and yours are well, and I wish it from my heart. Warm greetings and all the best, Nevenka. I, uh, P.S. I became an expert for the UF, UNFPA. The question of my concrete engagement will be discussed with them. So as you can see, uh, this is just a, like a, a short glimpse. I mean, there, there is, um, I have an enormous amount of archive material correspondence, correspondence that I have still to go through. Uh, but this gives a, a kind of sense of how uh, they were discussing institutions and cooperation and also how um, they were seen as experts, right? So um, Tom Schitsch was particularly sought after in international um, fora, but also Petrich, she, she was very uh, kept in high esteem in, in places like the IPPF, especially in the European region in which she was the most active. And she also became expert for the UNFPA, so this um, UN body for population politics, which uh, policies which also sponsored some, um, some courses and seminars within Yugoslavia itself. So just to have um, a short overview of um, of the lives of, of these women between, um, between let's say, the international and and um, and the trans and, like and the transnational and the and the Yugoslav context. So when when this letter was written, Nevenka Petrich was in her mid fifties, uh, so um, and and it was from the early eighties. So she was in the mid fifties, and Vida was seventy years old, and um, and the correspondence between the two of them seems to be the most intense from the mid 70s until the early 80s especially in relation to to family planning as Petrich was the president of the um, federal council for uh, family planning from 1967 onwards and while well, Tomšić at the same time was the main authority in Yugoslavia when it came to gender related policies from social welfare to abortion contraception and Planned Parenthood as it was called at the time so when we come to these biographical sketches um, we see that um, Vida Tomšić, she was born in, uh, in Ljubljana, in Slovenia, in a school teacher family as Vida Bernot in 1913, and she joined the Communist Party in 1934, spending uh, 11 months in prison already in the interwar period. She graduated in law in 1941 in Ljubljana. She was arrested, um, she was arrested uh, sorry, I put some noise in the background. I think Rory has his, has his sound on. Um, so the the she was arrested in uh, 1930 uh, sorry 1941 uh, just uh, after giving birth under Italian occupation so just after graduating she she also gave birth to to a child and under Italian occupation so from um, early later on she was arrested and her husband Tony Tomšić was executed by the Italian forces while she was condemned to 25 years in jail and um, she finally manages to escape after the fall of Italy in 1943, and she rejoined um, she rejoined her son, who was being hidden uh, by the family. So, like there were a number of issues there um, with with um, with Tomšić's life, like this trauma that that she had, not just of her about her um, her husband being executed, but also the separation, forced separation, which with, with her child. Um, which was uh, something that she she really suffered from, um, and 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 that she felt that was something that uh, she had to pay dearly in, for her um, communist um, communist engagement. In May forty five, she was appointed minister for social policy by the national government of Slovenia, and continued to hold important posts in the government of the Socialist Republic of Slovenia until her retirement and also uh, Yugoslav post. She remarried after the war to Dr. Franz Novak. And um, and this was an important um, connection because Franz Novak uh, was not only a former partisan, but he was he was also like a very very well known obstetrician gynecologist who was um, experimenting different kinds of um, surgeries for for abortion. And so together they really um, were discussing a lot about uh, contraception and abortion, and um, and this led. Um, their their lobbying, but also their their, their connection and their uh, cooperation with other activists led to the um, right to freely decide about childbirth to be inscribed in the 1974 Yugoslav Constitution, and we're going to come back to that. 
She was also the Yugoslav representative to the Social Development Commission of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, or ECOSOC, between 60 uh, to 63 and 71 to 74, and she chaired the commission uh, in 63. Uh, she was also especially active in the, in the International Planned Parenthood Federation, or IPPF, from 1967 onwards, when Yugoslavia joined um, this, this body and this international uh, NGO, as it was called and also during the UN decade for women. Now, the IPPF was already founded in the early 50s, but because of this um, neo-Malthusianist policies, so this idea that uh, birth control was kind of the main um, way to um, ensure that development would be reached in the third world by limiting the uh, births of um, the, the third world population, Yugoslavia didn't want to join in the 50s. And they, they lobbied uh, quite a bit until um, the constitution of the IPPS was, was changed and also like there were changes at the global level that led to this declaration that family planning was a was a human right right so this um, neomalthusianism never really disappeared from the IPPF as um, the works of Connolly for instance showed but the, there were other instances of anti-malthusianism or uh, critiques of this uh, Western imperialism uh, within the organization. And so Yugoslavia felt that it was a right time to join um, in uh, in the 60s when when um, kind of there were uh, different uh, approaches that were coexisting within the IPPF. Um, Tomšić was also especially active during the UN decade for women, and she was on the board of the INSTRO, uh, the International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women, which was located in Santo Domingo. It was supposed to be located in um, Iran before the, but then there was a revolution in Iran. So um, there was there was quite a lot of money given by the Shah in Persia, the Shah of Persia, before before the revolution. And then with the Iranian revolution, the the um, this install was relocated to um, to open finally in Santo Domingo. Uh, so Tomšić continued to be interested in women's and gender issues up and up until the very end of her life for instance in uh, 1995 three years before her death she wrote to the current instro director about the beijing beijing conference uh, on women so she really had um, a, a keen interest in everything that was related to social welfare and family and, and gender and women's emancipation and and sometimes when i present um my work on tom Shish, i hear oh but she was still a you know uh, um um, apologists for for the Yugoslav uh, regime and all that kind of um, usual accusation that that are um, um, thrown when we talk about communist women. You know, but I I, I believe that really uh, her her passion for these issues was authentic, and that can be really seen when uh, when it comes to uh, the the amount of work that uh, somebody like Tomšić or somebody like Betic put into. Um, into these issues and writing reports and, and working hard even uh, towards a, um, a later later age and they were really very much engaged as, as scholars of almost we could say um, into into such issues of gender and welfare and so really we can see some authentic um, interest and passion in in advancing women's rights and women's roles uh, on not only at the local level but also internationally when it comes to Petrich, so she was slightly um, of a younger generation than, than Tomšić. She, um, her family was a family of Serbs from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and her whole family joined the resistance movement in 1941, including Nevenka, who was only uh, 14 years old. Um, she lost her father, brother, and one of her three sisters in the war, so she was also heavily uh, affected by the war. And she quickly assumed leadership position in the youth organization in the Skoy and became the president of the United Alliance of the Anti-Fascist Youth of Yugoslavia for Central Bosnia in 1944. She held various offices in the post-war era, including Chief Officer for Health and Social Policy of Vanya Luka and Belgrade Old Town. And in between 61 and 69, she was the secretary of the Conference for the Social Activity of Women, the main state socialist women's organization that, as you know, had its federal headquarters, but was also having um, different Republican uh, boards. So each republic had its own um, Ktaj, um, uh, headquarter. In, in 67, she was elected vice president uh, for the Federal Council for Family Planning of Yugoslavia, Savezni Savet za Planirane Porodice. And the following year, she was elected by the president, uh, elected as president for a four year term 
and after that, reelected to the same position for another four year, four years. So she was there uh, for for quite a long time up until up until the late seventies, and in this capacity, she was involved also in the IPP. IPPF, especially in the Europe region. So the IPPF was divided between different regions. There was the European region, there was one for the Americas, um, the, another one for North Africa. So there, there were different regions and, and she was very active in the European region based in London. And also um, led, I will talk about this uh, in a moment, I will, she also led UNFPA sponsored courses on family planning for delegates from developing countries at the University of Sarajevo from 86 up to, uh, sorry, that should be 91, 1991. So the last one was in summer 91. In 1980, she defended a doctorate at the Faculty of Philosophy of Sarajevo, submitting a thesis of, on human freedoms, birth and self-management. So she was really invested in this issue of um, family planning also at the academic level. And later in her life, she uh, wrote poems, she wrote um, a reconstruction of anti-fascist resistance in the area um, around Banja Luka with uh, like a sort of kind of memoirs of her youth as an anti-fascist um, fighter. So she was really uh, active up until the end of her life in, in various academic and, and writing pursuits. And um, so um need to get to some text sorry I'm juggling here in different devices. So both women as I mentioned had a deep personal interest in issues of of women's emancipation and reproduction which also stem from personal stories as I mentioned and um one story that was especially interesting when it comes to uh, Tomšić that I didn't uh, uh, refer to before was the fact that uh, her mother was a servant in a school teacher family and ended up being pregnant from, uh, from the son of the family who ultimately married her. She also underwent an abortion as did Vida herself when she was a communist student persecuted by the regime of um, the interwar period, the, the monarchic Yugoslavia. And as I said, Petrich had a deeper scholarly interest in the issue, disputing Malthusianism and Neo-Malthusianism in her dissertation. So this dissertation that she wrote, um, she defended in 1980, was a kind of a refutation of Malthusianism and Neo-Malthusianism from a Marxist perspective. So Marx already wrote against Malthus at, uh, in his own time, and that's why there was a kind of a tradition of anti-Malthusianism as well um, within socialist countries. And, and she kind of retraced this whole history of um, um, of the fight against this idea that um, development and uh, resources are limited and have to be controlled by limiting the birth, um, limiting the population in, 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 the, in the global south or limiting the population among the poor because that was what Malthus was really um, hinting at in his, in his works. And her son recalled uh, in our interview how he, how he was complaining to um, to his mother that she was spending too much time in the office working with Malthus because he, he was a he was a child and he didn't know what what she was doing. So she was uh, she was trying to refute Malthusian ideas in her um, dissertation. Given that Yugoslavia had joined the IPPF in 1967, Petrich and Tomšić were especially keen to engage in international settings on issues related to women's rights, reproductive choices and to bring forward non-aligned standpoints, which were often critical of Western imperialism and supportive of Global South stances um, on various issues, as I mentioned, from the position to neo-Malthusianism to the global, to the demand for a new international economic order. In another letter um, from 1982, Petrich pointed at the publication of feminist journalist Slavenka Dracolic's article on the mortal sins of feminism in Dana's magazine, which she believed would interest Vida, she said. She also hinted already at her opposition to Miss Yugoslavia uh, was preliminary selection had taken place, she said, unfortunately, in my own native town of Banja Luka. She also sent to Tomšić an IPPF project on family planning as a fundamental human right to be carried out within the European region of IPPF in which she was engaged. The right to freely decide about childbirth became a constitutional right in Yugoslavia in 74, and much of the debate within the Federation was influenced by wider trends within IPPF. Um, and globally. At the same time, um, both activists had a significant impact on international conception of the family, gender, and family planning. Even if to many second wave feminists they appear to be part of the old guard of state socialist women's organization because of their connection with the Gdaj, 
their intervention at the conceptual level well, uh, extremely progressive. Tomšić especially saw the family in Marxist terms as an institution under constant transformation with individual and social choices as interdependent. So let me find it. Um, um, go back to Tomšić. So in 1984, in a public intervention in a meeting about population policies in the Yugoslav society, she stated that family planning was conceived differently than in Western countries, who were hoping to solve the issue of development by limiting population growth in the third world. In Yugoslavia, instead, the, conscious, the choice was for conscious, active, socially active parenthood. Uh, she said, parenthood is not only a biological process, but a social process. The biological aspect is birth, but everything before and after birth is social. The family was seen as a social fact and not a private one by Tomšić, one that required citizens' active participation and responsibility, including in parenting. Women's freedom about the reproductive choices, therefore, was seen by both activists as a cornerstone of socialist and human development. Especially this idea, like uh, this idea of active participation, that's something that they kept um, arguing about, uh, both at, at the Yugoslav level and also the international level. This idea that women should be active participants in their own societies, active participants in, in the process of development, and also um, active participants when it came to their reproductive choices. And uh, such stances were um, put forward in ITPF meetings and other international settings, opposing both pro-natalist and anti-natalist policies. And at that time, um, uh, again, there is uh, pro-natalism in various countries in Europe, but there is a strong anti-natalism coming from Western donors uh, towards third world countries. So they really intervene in this debate and they saw uh, both both of these um, pro-natalist and anti-natalist policies as an infringement on women's and people's freedom. And I mean, that is not to say that there weren't limits with all these um, family planning um, initiatives within Yugoslavia. Scholars such as Ivana Dobrivojevic, Branka Bogdan, Rada Dresdjic, they have highlighted that there were many limitations with, um, with the ways in which family planning was conceived, not a bit with, with the lack of available contraception, the scarce sexual education across the country and, and the widespread phenomenon of abortion as the main mean of birth control for most women. So there was a lot of talking about, you know, um, family planning and um, Tomšić and Petrić were really respected um, internationally because of their efforts, but still uh, when it came to the implementation of such family planning on the ground as uh, with other um, uh, aspects of, of social welfare in Yugoslavia, there were uh, very big discrepancies between uh, um, rural and urban areas, between different republics uh, with various degrees of development and so on. So uh, Branka Bogdan notably, she argued that there were uh, covert pronatalism in many, in many instances when it came to Yugoslav authorities. Um, for instance, in this brochure that I found here um, in, um, in the Zagreb archives. Um, Abortion started to be gradually liberalized in the early 50s and was fully liberalized in 1969. Yet uh, leaders such as Tomšić and Petrić always considered abortion as some kind of last resort, something that had to be there. Uh, but um, you know, they, they thought that responsible family planning started much earlier at the moment uh, of conception. And in an intervention at a conference on population politics and the socialist constitution in Bled in 71, Tomšić argued that abortion was fundamentally a class issue and that the liberalization of abortion followed demands by workers and women's movement. She argued that Planned Parenthood was about the right of individuals before conception, but about the right of the woman after conception if she wanted an abortion. So I mentioned earlier that both Tomšić and her mother experienced an abortion themselves. On her mother's life, she gave the following testimony. Um, in 1987, and I'm sorry if the translation is not great. I, I tried to translate from Slovene <laughs> through several devices online. I hope it works. So she said, another thing that greatly influenced me was a conversation I was listening to when I was 12 years old. So she overheard this conversation. My mother, who at that time already had five children, told her friend that she had aborted and she confessed it to the priest in the confession. Imagine, she said, the pastor does not even know what it means to have five children and does not want to give me an absolution. Her fate as an illegitimate mother also had an impact. When she was a maid in Ljubljana in the Bernard family, uh, the son went after her and so she gave birth to an Ill illegitimate child. She had a terrible life for the first four years and then my father, 
although it was an inappropriate relationship, decided to marry her. Having suffered, my mother began to wonder who was the solution, how should this change? I saw that the church could not help, and then through my cousin I came in contact with the communists and joined the party in 1934, because it seems to me that the only solution was in some way uh, practical political action. So this was kind of an interview about um, a life that she gave um, in, in the late 80s. Um, so how did Yugoslav experiences in relation to uh, self-management, but also internal underdevelopment or patriarchy were translated at the international level when Yugoslav leaders were engaging in international arenas. In a chapter I wrote for a forthcoming edit volume on Yugoslavia and the non-aligned movement, which um, is uh, Paul Stubbs tells me that is going to come out quite soon. Uh, he edited this this great volume with many uh, many interesting contributions. So in this chapter, uh, based on the women's press in uh, in Croatia, I noted that after the Soviet Yugoslav split, when Yugoslavia was expelled from the Women's International Democratic Federation, the encounters with female leaders and women's organization in non-aligned countries were a constant feature of women's magazines. The identification between Yugoslav women's participation in the liberation struggle an Asian African women fight for liberation was especially prominent, given that most Yugoslav female leaders, including Jovanka, uh, the wife of President Tito, had partisan um, experience and um, were partisan themselves. This facilitated a mirroring between the Yugoslav anti-fascist struggle and the many anti-colonial struggles across the world. In the 1959 account of Jovanka's trip to Indonesia, for instance, we read uh, the women of Indonesia took part massively in the struggle for liberation as fighters, nurses, social workers, and illegal workers in clandestine conditions. Many died courageously and some received military awards. Today, they are part of different organizations, all affiliated to Kovani or Congress Vanita, Indonesia, or the Indonesian Women's Congress. Um, such a paragraph could be easily applied to Yugoslav women during and after the foundation of the anti-fascist women's front during World War II. So really there was this idea, okay, the, the women uh, were part of the revolutionary and liberation struggle and now they're taking part in the construction of their respective countries. This parallel was established further by Hartini, one of the wives of President Sukarno, when she visited Zagreb in 1960, she stated, the women of Indonesia actively took part in the struggle for liberation. Uh, for the liberation of their country and for the preservation of its independence. Like the women of Yugoslavia, we had a significant role in mobilizing the popular forces against foreign power, which ruled our country for many decades. Um, so Yugoslav activists could easily identify with activists from the Global South, not only due to their common experience as revolutionary and freedom fighters, but also due to their similar efforts in emancipating women in new post-colonial states and post-revolutionary states, we could say. Women's struggles for their political, social, and economic rights and their attempt to overcome conservative religious norms and illiteracy was part and parcel of this modernization after, effort in the 50s and 1960s. And Yugoslav activists frequently exchange impressions with activists from the global south concerning legal obstacles to women's equality and ongoing challenges to women's emancipation and modernization. Uh, and, and we really see that uh, even before the emergence of second wave feminism, uh, Yugoslav activists were keen to stress that gender issues were social issues and they had to be solved in cooperation with state institutions rather than by separate women's organizations. So they often stressed that separate women's organizations um, couldn't do much. Uh, they took the example of Egypt, for instance, where they saw um, women's organization as bourgeois and separated from um, the kind of uh, state state reform and state revolution and so there they were critical of of the position of um separate women's organization for instance so they often stress that women's organization as in yugoslavia they had to be part of um of the state apparatus or be kind of a state feminist endeavor to be successful and that's something that was often repeated in various encounters alongside the primacy of class over gender which which led to that stance what Yugoslavia also promoted in its diplomatic agenda was economic independence through industrialization and modernization, this idea of uh, self-reliance, as shown by recent research um, on, on Yugoslav companies' commercial, commercial exchanges with non-aligned countries, um, uh, especially in the, in the work done by 
Lubica Spaskovka and Anna Kalori on, on this idea of self-reliance and, and cooperation with the global south. The building of industries, streets, inf welfare infrastructures such as hospitals and schools and the expansion of education were all seen as crucial means to achieve political and economic independence. And women's organizations were embedded in this effort of reconstruction and modernization, both in Yugoslavia and in non-aligned countries. And this was common to a transnational generation of communist and socialist activists who founded women's organization after World War II and in the early Cold War era. And so when we when we look at this um, this uh, press, um, the different accounts of, of these encounters, um, there is there is certainly a certain um, at times some kind of cultural imperialism or, or or Yugocentrism, that's something that is discussed in detail in, in the volume that's uh, that's going to appear on Yugoslavian and on the line world. But there's also uh, a great degree of identification and empathy and solidarity. And uh, this this idea that, you know, certain uh, social experiments that have been done in Yugoslavia could be repeated elsewhere. And Yugoslav representatives are often visiting local orphanages, clinics, schools, newly built institutions, um, the emphasis is really on this reconstruction and rebuild of, of the state and of post-colonial states. Um, during, during her trip to West Africa and North Africa, for instance, Jovanka visited a nursing school for women in Ghana, an orphanage in Morocco, and a women's weaving cooperative in Tunisia. In turn, when foreign guests were welcomed in Yugoslavia, they were often taken to see similar sites in Zagreb or Belgrade or in smaller centers, and they were exchanging experiences and, and views about uh, how to build institutions and uh, especially uh, social welfare institutions. Institutional thinking in view of overall social modernization was also part of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia's strategy at the United Nations. The resolution of social and economic issues was at the core of Tom Shish's mission in the ECOSOC, and as I mentioned, she was uh, very active in the ECOSOC and um, a report um, on her activism at the time noted that social policies were key to citizens' well-being and many socialist countries might have had a lower GDP than Western countries but were faring far better when it came to issues of schooling, health, social welfare and housing, that is, living standards in general. Later on, during the UN Decade for Women, Yugoslavia took a very active role in supporting the 74 Declaration for a new international economic order within the UN General Assembly. And throughout the UN Decade for Women, Yugoslav representatives openly sided with non-aligned and other developing countries in arguing that the achievement of women's emancipation was uh, strictly related to the transformation of relations of production across the world and that women's struggle should not be separated from wider political issues. And that's something that kind of created some conflict with um, Western organization. Christine Godsey, in her, in her book, Second World, Second Sex, has written extensively about this um, divide between uh, socialist and third world women's organization on the one hand and Western women's organization, especially feminist groups, uh, during the UN decade, and how this division was kind of mapping onto uh, different geopolitical um, alliances and, and, and belonging. And uh, on the one hand, there was this alliance between socialist and, and global South women's organizations saying, yes, we need to consider women's issues in relation to development and wider um, geopolitical divides. While on the on the side of um, Western feminism, there was this fear that um, all these debates might depoliticize um, the UN conferences for women. And they might just detract from focusing on, on, on specific women's issues, especially issues of um, violence and sexuality and so on. So it's uh, another another very interesting uh, book on this is um, Jocelyn Olcott uh, monograph on the Mexico City conference and the different uh, positions that were emerging there. Um, so alongside this uh, UN decade for women, there was also um importantly there were many conferences on the role of women in development that were organized at the level of the non-aligned movement so um in parallel to the un decade there were uh, several conferences one in baghdad in 79 on the role of women in development of non-aligned and other developing countries another meeting of high level experts um, of NAM countries uh, concerned with the role of women in developing in havana in 1981 
and uh, a ministerial meeting in New Delhi in April 85 in preparation for the Nairobi Conference on Women of 85. So um, this is the moment when there is really um, a great degree of exchange between, uh, between Yugoslavia and other countries in the Global South in relation to um, gender and women's issues, and that's kind of spurred by um, the whole mobilization uh, around the UN DEC that uh, really transformed the way in which we, we conceive knowledge about women's and gender issues at a global level. And um, so uh, one, one lecture uh, that was uh, quite important was this one delivered by Tom Shic, uh, at the Center for Women's Development Studies uh, in India in New Delhi and this Center for Women's Development Studies that is something that was specifically emerging uh, during the UN decade it was founded by um, by this woman Vina Mazumdar who was a pioneer of um, social sciences um, as interpreted from a gender perspective she was the one who wrote a report for the uh, Mexico City conference about India and how um, many women had been uh, left behind by development policies in India and the, and the report was considered too critical so it wasn't presented in Mexico and uh, and she had a, a great degree of cooperation with Yugoslavia and um, and and so she uh, she invited uh, Tomšić to give uh, to give this lecture and in this lecture um, um, she said, uh, it is largely owing to the experience and efforts of developing and online countries that the problem of the status of women is no longer being seen only as an issue exclusively concerning the women's movement or as a humanitarian and legal problem, but it has become one of the key questions of every country's development. The decade led not only to recognition of the needs and problems of women, but also to an awareness of the power that women represent. At the end of the UN decade for women, the question could therefore also be turned around. Not only what can the United Nations, the non-aligned movement and governments do for women, but what do women contribute? What do they mean for the development of every country and of the world as a whole? And here again, we see that this emphasis on self-reliance and on, on women's active participation and, and, and engagement, that was something that was um, uh, very, very much present, and it was resounding with, with uh, Global South initiatives in the field of development. And um, and again, this this reference to humanitarianism is something that Tomšić uh, used a number of times, especially when talking about second wave feminism. She thought that second wave feminists were just um, portraying women as victims and being having a kind of humanitarian approach, and that they were not going far enough when it came to the transformation of. Um, class relations but also global power relations and on the other hand um, because of this generational conflict of course second wave feminists so uh, the old guard of state feminism as uh, blocking debate and 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 um, keeping keeping the terms of the debate uh, very close somehow and, and and here you know when, when you read such documents you see that there was a certain kind of rigidity but also that there was um, a great awareness when it came to, um, let's say, what we call today intersectionality. So uh, there again, we see that it, it, we don't have an easy answer when we when we ask, okay, was this fully progressive? Were there some limitations? Of course, there were some limitations, especially in the in the way in which the discourse was framed. But still, the gender issues were were um, considered always in relation to either social and uh, and class and. Uh, um, race issues, and that's something that um, eventually was brought back with the with the whole um, intersectional approach in uh, in feminism. Mina um, Mazumdar was very, uh, and other other um, other pioneers of uh, uh, women's movement in um, in India, such as the Vaki Jain, for instance, economy the Vaki Jain. She uh, included Tom Shish in her list of four mothers within her book on women development and, and the United Nations from two thousand and five. While Mazumdar prefaced a Tom Shish lecture, and she wrote, with a Tom Shish life represent the ideal of women's studies, in which scholarship is not relegated to the ivory tower, but is involved in action for change, drawing new inspiration and awareness through such involvement in both action and scholarship. She is a visionary and accepts the challenge of giving shape to a future which is still unreal in most ordinary mortals' view. She was involved from the beginning in the concept of the new international economic order and took up the challenge of ensuring the incorporation of the women's issue as an integral part of the concept. She told me once, if we do not do it now, then the vision will be incomplete, distorted and will defeat its purpose. 
So that was some kind of anti-literal gender mainstreaming from a Marxist and, and class-based perspective and, and, and online perspective. Um, okay, so the one I'm already talking quite a bit. So the when it comes to family planning and um, and international engagement, it was without doubt uh, Neven Kapetric who was uh, active on the ground, especially within the IPPF. I mean, Tomšić was also very uh, very active, but because of her um, advanced age, she would um, be more seen as a kind of uh, uh, authority theoretician. Uh, but um, it was uh, younger collaborators such as Petrich and, and others like Jiva Beltram and uh, other women working on family planning that were doing a lot of work behind the scenes, especially in these um, international institutions. So Petrich in a 1971 intervention, um, she wrote, the social position of women in any society is the measure of the emancipation of the society or the state community as it reflects the position of men in general. So that's something that Tom Shish was also repeating quite a lot, like the, uh, the way in which women are, are living is kind of the measure of development of a society. And that's something that came from, uh, that came, comes from Fourier, Marxist, that's what Marx, that's something very um, common to hear. But, but like Petrich in, inserted family planning and, and sexuality into this. And she said, there is no country today, even countries with socialist social systems, which would not have reason to re-examine the causes of resistance to the full of emancipation of women as a social being from the standpoint of women's growth into a subject of her own liberation. So here she's using already some kind of feminist language. Um, she says the full emancipation of women, her liberation, and the development of her overall personality cannot even be imagined without a conscious effort of the entire society to change the awareness of both men and women, particularly in the field of sexual relationship. So I, I see here some influence of um, women's movements, obviously, uh, and uh, also this uh, emphasis on the fact that men as well, they need to be aware and active in um, family planning as responsible parents. So alongside the deep awareness of gender issues, the issue of global geopolitical divides uh, was also something that Petrich was engaged about. And one example, and um, this is something I, I, um, I'm planning to do more research about, of course, this is something that um, needs to be documented further. But one example that I found is this um, report about the 1977 meeting in, in Edinburgh uh, a conference from the IPPF in which uh, Petrich was kind of having this um, very critical and, and very uh, almost uh, polemical role. She criticizes, for instance, the distribution of oral contraceptives by non-medical personnel. That was something that was um, happening a lot in this project funded by uh, Western donors. There is a whole um, literature talking about how all these um, gurus of um, neo Malthusianism basically uh, weren't really uh, caring about the safety of these contraceptive devices. They were just happy that they would be, they would be distributed to third world women and, and people just you know to, to make sure that um, birth control would advance. However, um, the, it, this was done uh, many times in a very uh, unprofessional or uh, unsafe manner. And um, there's a lot of studies on how um, uh, some of these contraceptives, they really had uh, bad side effects on, on a number of uh, third world women. And there were all the sterilization campaigns in India that are the most famous one, but also um, the, the distribution of these IUDs, which were not fit for purpose. That's something that has been um, considered a lot by, by the scholars. So uh, Petrich was criticizing that you know, the medical personnel was, um, was um, um, doing this community-based distribution of, of contraceptives. And this kind of um, was um, like delegates from other countries and especially Turkey shared this critique and argued that um, this uh, non-medical distribution of contraceptive pills was turning people into guinea pigs of um, Western um, programs. And um, together with the French representative, Petrich was also the only one to raise the issue of neo Malthusianism within the organization. So she kept saying, you know, we have to be careful not to um, not to be um, 
dominated by this neo-Malthusianism, also because there was an excessive reliance by the IPPF on these US donors like uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, which were uh, very much um, using uh, neo-Malthusianism uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to respond to issues of development. And uh, there were all this panic about the population bomb and so on. Yeah. Another issue that, uh, that uh, the Yugoslav raised quite a bit was the fact that there was not much democracy in IPPF decision-making structures, but also in the media. So they kept sending these letters to IPPF saying, um, you publish this article uh, that is uh, very much um, proposing some neo Malthusianism, but you haven't given any um, counter argument or so they, they, they really try to uh, be active also at the level of publications and, and um, and to lobby within behind the scene kind of for for different views to be represented within the IPPF. Um, and uh, even if they were very critical of the IPPF, they decided to stay in the IPPF because they thought that they could influence it from within uh, and increase bilateral contacts. And that's something that they did as well for, for the Women's International Federation. They, they didn't fully rejoin it, but they still attended meetings so that they could meet women from the global south and uh, Petrich interventions were appreciated by various delegates from the global south uh, for instance the representative from puerto rico uh, was very very happy that she denounced u.s colonization and she would she was delighted with uh, Petrich criticism of u.s policies and uh, the yugoslav exchange materials and planned delegation exchanges with lebanon jordan egypt and the philippines and the Tunisian representative, um, which I suppose is Fethiya Manzali, um, she doesn't name her, but uh, it's most likely her. She was uh, representing both the Women's Association in Tunisia and the IPPF North Africa. And she said that they had translated an article by Petrich against neo Malthusianism into French and Arabic. And finally, there was this uh, Bangladeshi representative who complimented Petrich for speaking about the new international economic order. And she told her that she stands for the word poor as a real communist. So she got a lot of uh, praise from the third world country representatives. Uh, even the Western representatives, however, uh, seem to be very, very um, um, mindful and, and to listen very carefully any time that Tom Schicher Petrich sent in some criticisms. Like women like John Retty or Julie Henderson who were at the head of, of the IPPF, they, um, they uh, extensively corresponded with Yugoslav activists and they seem to keep them in high esteem um, and again this this idea that planned parenthood was a basic human right and um, was was something that was especially appreciated by fellow colleagues from the global south and Petrich um, supported the Indian uh, representative um, intervention which said that family planning programs cannot be a substitute for development again here we will have to see more into India because India was um, a country where this um, sterilization were uh, very much ongoing at the time so that's something I, I have a question like to what extent um, Yugoslav women were aware of this and to what extent they were discussing such um, issues with uh, Indian counterparts that would be something to um, to explore further especially in relation to this complicity of um, Democrats or state feminists with um, the state apparatus in, in cases like this India sterilization programs. The, this connection referred and strengthened during the UF, UNFPA sponsored courses held at the University of Sarajevo for women from developing countries, which were led by Petic and had Tom Schich as a guest, as in this picture here on the uh, bottom um, right, you see here uh, Petic and here is Vida Tom Schich. And um, the courses were held from uh, 1986 up until summer 91 and most likely uh, Petrich had this connection with the University of Sarajevo because that's where she defended her um, PhD and um, I could interview Petrich's son and he, and he remembered that women from Asia, Africa, uh, various participants were often picked up by his dad at the airport in Belgrade and they were brought to um, Petrich home in the in, in Belgrade in the capital uh, on the way to and back from Sarajevo and that she had very very warm relationship with them uh, so when I looked at the names there, there were some of uh, in this private archive that uh, I, I was uh, I was um, entrusted with I mean some some there were there were some there was this PowerPoint presentation basically with some of the names 
uh, I had some pictures of these women, but I couldn't track back all of them. But those who can still be found, like online, and most of them couldn't. But those who could be found uh, were lawyers, doctors, medical practitioners, sociologists, writers, some young activists, and um, they came from different countries, including Egypt, Syria, Kenya, DRC, Nigeria, Zimbabwe. Some came from also closer Mediterranean countries, such as Cyprus, Malta, Turkey. Um, one woman was uh, coming from Mexico. And these extraordinary pictures from uh, Petri's private archive testify to the great degree of friendship and comradeship that was established within this transnational encounters in, in Sarajevo. Uh, and, and this is still very much work in progress, uh, but in the near future, I would like to further explore um, like an oral history with some of the women who have been part of this course would be fantastic, of course, but uh, I'm not sure to what extent we can we can track them back. Uh, I in the in the archives in Belgrade, I was hoping to find a more detailed list of the participants, but there were only some names, not all of them. And and this is I find quite moving, like this this picture from 1991, um, that up until up until the summer 91, um, Petrich was engaged in this. Um, this international seminar in Sarajevo just before the war. Um, so I'm going towards a conclusion. So um, as I said, in, in the near future, it would be great to explore further the history of women in the non-aligned movement and non-aligned solidarity connections. Scholarly debates on transnational women's activism tend to focus on the 60s and 70s and on the second wave, or on the third wave that followed the Beijing conference in 95. There, there, there are also a few scholars who have rediscovered a lost wave of Cold War women's activism. I mean, the, the, this literature is growing from the pioneering work of Francisca de Han on the WIDF to uh, some new <coughs> publications on transnational connection. Christine Godsey, she wrote about the connections between Bulgaria and Zimbabwe. Uh, Julia Graskova, she explored the WIDF uh, archives in um, the Soviet uh, Soviet women branch of the uh, WIDF in Moscow and their connection with women in the global south and that's also extremely interesting in terms of both kind of solidarity and limitation what what she argues in in this book in the center in the middle is that um, even if the WIDF was very clearly oriented towards the Soviet bloc they still couldn't um, control the ways in which women from the third world would would um, um, take part in the federation and kind of adapt its um, messages to their own uh, context so that you know there, there were so many different uh, points of view and point of like so many um, um, ways in which the WIDF was experienced and we cannot just say you know WIDF was <coughs> controlling um, women from the global south because the women from the global south they came in with their own agenda and their own ideas and they were often joining both the WIDF and, and some other um, Western liberal women's organization. Uh, so, um, the history, like, there is, there has been quite some work done on WIDF, but the history of non aligned women's networks is still unwritten. There is this book by Laura Beer on revolution and womanhood in Nasser's Egypt, which is very interesting about also this connection between uh, Egypt and Sub Saharan Africa. And, and more of that could be done in terms of systematic comparisons of cross-border women's activism uh, during the Cold War and also um, further establishing interdisciplinary dialogues between post-colonial and post-socialist studies. Um, <clears throat> the role played by female leaders, state-sponsored women organization and grassroots women's movement in NAM encounters from the mid-50s up until the fall of the Berlin Wall remains unexplored, even if non-alignment generated its own specific transnational network and conferences, and even if female leaders such as Indira Gandhi, Sirimavo Bandaranaike, Vilma Spin, and Vida Tomšić all played a strong role in cross-border solidarity initiatives on women's rights. So these are just some of the portraits of other women who were similarly engaged in family planning and non-alignment, which I think uh, should be uh, <coughs> explored. So again, further steps or history with the women from this course in Sarajevo, oral history in, uh, with women engaged in transnational family planning networks in Yugoslavia. Not all of them are alive anymore, but this will be something to uh, explore further. And also 
uh, transnational, the transnational lives of women in an online movement. So biographies, autobiographies, dissertations, and, and this is something I'm, I'm trying to um, work on further. So these are some of the, the women that um, are very interesting um, protagonists of this era. And I think the kind of their, their biographies are sort of matching and mapping upon the ones of Petrich and Tomsch, for instance, Aziza Hussain, who was the founder of the Cairo Family Planning Association before becoming the first woman representative to the UN General Assembly and an active member of the Commission on the Status of Women and also president of the IPPF between 77 and 83. And um, she left her papers in Cairo, she left an autobiography and there are there is some correspondence with her uh, and um, Yugoslav women because of her uh, position in the IPPF. Um, this Fatia Mzali, I think this is a woman that uh, Petrich is referring to, the representative from Tunisia, who was among the founder of the Union of uh, Tunisian Women, also birth control activist and later a minister for family and women. She was married to one of the um, main politician uh, in Tunisia in, um, at the time. And uh, she also headed the IPPF region for the Middle East and North Africa and directed the Tunisian delegation at Mexico City. She didn't leave an autobiography, but there are other autobiographies that are present um, when it comes to uh, UNFT activists. Uh, Avabai Vadia, that's, uh, that's a woman who said that um, family planning cannot be a substitute for development. So she was among the founders of the IPPF itself, but also she was engaged in the All India Women's Conference, as well as the Family Planning um, Association of India. And she left an extensive archive as well as an autobiography. And uh, finally, uh, another woman that's uh, key in this period is um, Monika Krause Fuchs, who was from East Germany, but because of her marriage, she um, she uh, moved to Cuba and she was engaged in the Federation of Cuban Women and later became Cuba's most prominent sex educator before leaving Cuba in 1990 due to disagreement about Cuban policies on gender and homosexuality. And there are several documentaries about her and also an autobiography she wrote. So I think all of these women um, could be could be key figures to uh, ask um, different questions about the non-aligned movement, notably what was the role of female activists and leaders within the non-aligned movement? How did women's organizations contribute to nation building, modernization and development in their respective non-aligned countries? What was the significance of the non-aligned movement in transnational Cold War debates on women's rights before and during the UN decade for women? And especially how did women's internationalism within the NAM contribute to an intersectional vision of women's rights? which viewed women's oppression as inseparable from wider global inequalities. So these are the, the further kind of ideas. And uh, but as I said, this is still a work in progress. So I would be really happy to have your feedback and questions. So now I'm going to start to 